Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading for today is found in Isaiah chapter 50. It will be on page 598 of your two Bibles. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 10. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment, and the moths will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is 116 verses 1 through 9 at, on page 494 of your pew Bibles. I'll read the odd-numbered verses. Please respond with the even. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. And I called on the name of the Lord. The Lord save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the unwary. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. When the Lord hath delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Praise be to God. Our second reading for today is taken from James chapter 3. Verses 1 through 12. They're on pages 978 and 979 of your few Bibles. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. <coughs> Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boats. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a word of e world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it is in itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? or a grapevine bear figs, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 
Uh, please rise with your article for the gospel. Our gospel this morning comes to us from Mark in the ninth chapter. Praise to you, O Lord. I'll be reading Mark 9, 14 through 29. Mark 9, 14. This is titled, The Healing of a Boy with an Evil Spirit. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teacher of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. O oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long is this? How, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It is often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd, that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. This is the gospel of our Lord. Uh, grace and peace. That peace that only Jesus knows and can give us from our Lord and Savior. So what were the lessons in our gospel this morning? Yeah, you can't tell me one thing, I hope anyway. Because we know there are always many. But that's the greatness of the Bible. It has so many different lessons in so many different areas and so many different places that we can never say, well, this is, this is the lesson this morning. Because we can reread it over and over again and find new, new lessons and new teachings. Now, i got to admit, something that caught my attention was the, the first thing we read. The argument going on. Remember what Jonah read about James saying, tame the tongue, quit spewing out things, quit saying things you don't know what you're talking about? Yeah. Now remember, you go back a little bit in the Gospel, and this is when Jesus, Peter, James, and John were coming down the mountain from, the trans from Jesus' transfiguration, right? I mean, they came down the mountain from a glorious moment. And what did they walk into? The world. The world. The teachers arguing with the disciples. Verse 14, when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Sounds so familiar, doesn't it? When we're on top of the mountain, we come back into the world and find the same gritty stuff going on. Now, our gospel doesn't tell us exactly what the teachers of the law were saying. It doesn't say exactly what they were arguing with the disciples about. But we can inject from past references and from the rest of the reading that they were probably not being nice. Probably claiming the disciples were frauds for even trying to drive out the demon. I mean, think about it. 
That's what the teachers of the law were doing. That was what they were spending their time on. Trying to disclaim and dis disfame Jesus and everything that the disciples were doing. But then again, that brings out human nature. It's been going on for centuries. How we love to point out what other people are doing that's wrong. I mean, especially if we think it's wrong, if we think it's wrong anyway. Instead of being supportive and trying to help them, trying to help them through their, their trial, or maybe help them with the cause, what do we do? We say, I don't agree with them. We try to knock them down, knock them back into their place. No. The old saying about not being part of the problem, being part of the solution, comes very true there, doesn't it? I mean, I don't get me wrong. There are times when we have to correct people. When people do wrong things, there are times they need to be, be called out on and corrected. But correcting somebody to help them and correcting somebody to just be mean are two different missions. And it's, it's so normal in our world. We love to correct people to be mean, not to support. And what I've found in my, my short life of 63 years is that there are normally more times that we need to just to shut up and let it go. Yeah, when we see somebody doing something wrong, more times than not, we need to let it go and say a prayer and let God, because we can't change it. Yeah, I know that sounds like a, a cop out, but you know, I'm going to take care of this because I'm, I'm a man. I can do this. But we can't change hearts. We might be able to change minds for a few hours or maybe in a few minutes. But what's in the heart, only God can change. That's why I need to look for our faith for the answers. And I know most of our world will tell you that's just cliche, that old faith and all that God stuff is just a joke, that we've got to take care of this right now. But you know, God's been here forever, and he says, I'll take care of it if you trust me. I mean, that's why he sent his son to be with us, to get us back on track, to give us a better view of what is important in life, and to help us find peace in our trials. It's like our next verse. And I mean this verse. Every time I read it, it's one you can read over just like that. But if you actually read it, verse 15. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and rank and greed. Yeah. Right there is, is the basis of faith. These people were in the middle of listening to this argument, listening to the teacher of the law, the big shots of the world, slamming these disciples, telling them they don't know a thing. But they saw Jesus, and their minds changed. Their hearts changed. They followed him, they ran to greet him. I mean, that's what true faith is all about, that we abandon the junk in our world that's being thrown at us by humans. And we go back to Jesus. No matter how obscure or how he happens to be there. I mean, that's a personal choice, though, wasn't it? That people chose to walk away from the world that he argued and, and follow Jesus. No. It's a simple fact. We've got to drop our addictions, our human ways, and our human ideas, and come to God. So that's one of the biggest lessons in this section, I think, that we actually want, we actually go past because we're focused on the arguing and what's going to happen next, and we miss it. How many people walked away from the argument following Jesus? No. No matter how much someone tells us they know, no matter how much power they say they have, no matter how much our peers tell us that this person's right, we have to be able to let go of it. When the truth comes along, we have to be able to say, that's it. I'm following. I'm going to follow God. No, it leads us right to our, our next lesson in our, in our scripture. We jump to verse 18 and read the disciples' failure, if you will, to heal the demon possession. 
Verse 18, whoever receives it, but throws it to the ground. He falls to the mouth, dashes his teeth, becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to write out the spirit, but they could not. So why couldn't they do it? Does everyone like make you wonder? I've, I've thought of that a lot of times. Why couldn't they do it? Well, we see what I think is the same problem with the boy's father. Verse 22. It often has thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. But if you can, what trust is that? What trust is that in our Lord and Savior? But if you can do anything, take pity on us. See, that's our problem. We have a, a spot in our heart. You know, I talk about that spot in our heart where everybody has a demon that hides out in there. Because, as our confession says, we're by nature sinful and unclean. None of us are pure. We have those spots in our heart that keep us in the dark a little bit, that keep us always ready to go the wrong way. And that spot keeps our doubt right there on the edge. Well, sure is a good thing about God to change this, but if you're really kid or not, I don't know. No, it's simple. No matter how much we want to believe, no matter how much we're sure we're ready to tackle Satan, we seem to fail because we harbor a little place in our heart that has doubt. Yeah, and that's all it takes, that one little spot. I mean, it sounds harsh in a church to say we don't believe like we should, but that's part of being faithful. It's a fact of life and of faith that we have to mature every day. We don't get there. We always need Jesus. Like I say, we don't just all of a sudden one day say, ah, I'm faithful. I'm 100% Christian. Look at me. Believe me, it doesn't happen. Because if we're honest, look back at verse 19. This is Jesus. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long should I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Yeah, this wasn't the fluffy bunny Jesus that we love that says, oh, I love you and you're so good. Jesus was saying, look at yourselves. What am I going to do with you? You don't want to take the next step. You want to sit back here and act like, oh, yeah, I'm a believer, I'm the man. And, but when something terrible happens, where are you? It's proof that Jesus expects us more to say than to say we're believers. That we got to live it. Verse 20, so they brought him, the boy that is. When the Spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled out around, falling into the mouth. You see the contrast there? This was a demon. This was the evil of the world. He saw Jesus and went crazy. We see Jesus and go, oh, it's Jesus. Oh, you hear me? I want you to. No, the demon saw Jesus come and went, oh, no. He's going to he's gonna make me do what he wants. Verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how has been like this? From childhood, he answered, it often is thrown into the fire or walk or kill him. And like I say, here it is. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can't, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. There again, like I say, the doubt that Jesus deals with in our hearts and our bodies. But the good news is we don't have to fight this. We don't have to worry about it. Because Jesus knows it's in there. We can't do nothing on ourselves. We go to verse 24, which is probably the, the most honest belief, the most honest prayer, maybe, the most honest asking that anybody's ever done. Verse 24, to me, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. That right there is the most honest line that we're going to read in our scripture this morning. Like I say, most probably don't see it as a prayer. But one more prayer that can we 
ask for than that right there. Lord, help me to find you, even when I'm being mean. Even when I'm sure I'm on top of everything, help me humble my heart and realize that I'm missing you. Help me with my unbelief. Help me with my doubt that's stuck down in here that I can't get rid of by myself. That the Heavenly Father says, you need my son to get through this. You need my son to get through life because you can't do it on your own. Imagine if those church, early church lawmakers would have tried asking Jesus to help them instead of arguing with the disciples. Think about how, how that would have changed the whole world. Instead of their whole mission of trying to put Jesus back in his place and hide him and, well, kill him. Think of that ask God to help them with their doubt and help them find the truth. No. Everything in life we go through, we ask God if you can do this, if you can do this. And we try to understand what's he doing? What is he doing? Do I see what he's doing? Now I bet it. There's times you ask yourself, God, are you really with me? Are you helping me or not? And then we got to come back down to the fact that and humble our hearts that it's not about our knowledge. It's not about our wondering or knowing or seeing what he's doing. It's about our faith. It's about us trusting God and knowing He's going to do what He's going to do. If I can. Lord Jesus, we know You can. Can I wait and trust in You until it happens? No, it's, there are so many lessons in this, in this Gospel again. So many places to look at. I mean, you get to the end. The final lesson, if you will. We look at why the disciples couldn't do the miracle of driving out the demon. Again, we ask ourselves, why couldn't they? Well, it's simple. It was because it was more than they could do alone. They needed God to say it was time. So that's the other thing we don't understand. Verse 28, 29, after Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. There's the lesson. We can't get discouraged if we fail. We can't get discouraged if we see bad things continually happening. we got to pray and let God take care of it because we can't change it. With God's help, He'll send us the right way or the right people or whatever we need. But in the meantime, we can't change it. Again, that's what, three lessons? Maybe four that I come up with out of that? Yeah. That we got to quit spewing off our anger and our arguing about things until we know for sure. we got to humble our hearts and trust in God. We've got to wait for God, for His answers and His plan. And we got to go to God because He's the only one who can do it. No, Jesus doesn't need to be asked if He could. Because we know He can. We just have to humble our hearts and accept it. And when we do that, it all falls into place. And like I said, there's going to be trials in life, there's going to be times when we wonder. But as I've said many times too, those are the times that make us understand the good times. Jesus never came to be a, a fluffy fix-it-all, I'm going to make you walk on water type guy. Because even one of the disciples, remember him, he walked on water for a split second? And went down. Because the doubt in his heart. But Jesus said, I'll fix it, take my hand. So never worry. Never be discouraged when you're walking along and you're happy as a lark and something hits and you go, oh Lord, are you there? And that's what happens to many of our people. We walk away from God and say, well, he didn't do nothing anyway. We've got to give him a chance. 
Ah, dear Lord, let us pray. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, we know you can. Lord, our theme for this year is trust in you. Last year we talked about believing in you. That's the first step. And then we had to trust. That's the second step. Lord Jesus, our human nature, our sinful nature will always try to make us look the other way, just like Eve. The world got her to look the other way instead of trusting in your Father. And it made her go the wrong way. But he came and straightened them out again. So Lord Jesus, we just ask you to, to go into our hearts, go into the people around us' hearts. Help us to ignore the world and come back to you when we hear your word voice or we see a chance to be with you. We need to drop everything and run to be with you because the world's not going to guide us. So Lord Jesus, we say yes, you can. But teach us to accept it that you can. That's probably the biggest part for us to see it. So continue to guide us, Jesus. Continue to just be our Lord. Continue to walk us through this thing called life and focus on the truth, not what the world is spewing in our faces. Then we know that we'll make it to the end with you and we'll stand in your Father's house where you promised. Thank you for being our guide. Uh, Lord Jesus, we just pray this all of you in your holy name. Amen. Amen.